Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the seminar from the Center for Precision Health Research. And a speaker today who's coming to us virtually from the Broad, uh, Dr. David Liu. Um, there are a lot of people in the room, and there are even more people on the internet from what we've been able to see, because uh, I think this is a topic that many people are really intensely interested in. We're fortunate to have Dr. Liu as our speaker today. I'm Francis Collins, uh, serving currently as an NIH Distinguished Investigator in the Intramural Program of the National Human Genome Research Institute and a member of the Center for Precision Health Research. David Liu is the Richard Merkin Professor and Director of the Merkin Institute of Transformative Technologies in Healthcare at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. He's also Vice Chair of the Faculty there. He is a named professor, the Thomas Dudley Cabot Professor of the Natural Sciences at Harvard, and he's a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. His research, which he's going to tell us about, very creatively integrates chemistry, which is his uh, significant uh, professional background, and evolutionary development of interesting structures to illuminate biology and facilitate next generation therapeutics. His development of base editing and prime editing and other things he's going to tell you about has been recognized in multiple ways. Even seven years ago, he was a breakthrough of the year finalist for Science Magazine uh, for base editing. And much more has happened since then. His background uh, obviously began um, from an early point in his career as being exceptional, and then he graduated first in his class at Harvard in 1994, uh, went on to do doctoral research at the University of California, Berkeley, and went straight from there to a faculty position at Harvard, uh, where he's now a full professor. He's a member of the National Academy. He's won a number of important awards, including the King Faisal Prize Laureate in Medicine, the American Chemical Society David Perlman Award, and he was chosen to be the NIH Marshall Nirenberg Lecturer a few years ago. He's also an entrepreneur. He's the founder of, or co-founder of several public and private biotechnology and therapeutics companies, including Beam Therapeutics and others. I'm also proud to say that he's a friend and a collaborator when he gave that lecture at NIH a few years ago, I had the chance to meet with him right before he made the presentation. And he showed me some data on a disease that my lab has been working on for more than 20 years, uh, the disease hutchinson guilford progeria syndrome, which you heard described in this very room a few months ago uh, when Leslie Gordon, the head of the Progeria Research Foundation, and Sammy Basso, who's a young man who's affected with the condition, and I told you about it. But David is an absolutely critical part uh, of that whole enterprise. And basically, as a consequence of his involvement in this enterprise, we have moved it forward in a way that maybe he'll touch on to try to move the possibility of an in vivo gene editing solution, maybe dare one say a cure, uh, for a disorder that affects multiple different organ systems and which is caused by a single nucleotide substitution uh, one out of three billion base pairs, which now can be approached uh, by the kind of capabilities that his technology has made possible. I would also say David is an incredibly generous person. He's made the capability for other people to ta take on his uh, technologies readily accessible. And he's also somebody that is uh, a lot of fun to work with uh, as somebody who's open and warm and very personable in all that he's done, including working with progeria patients in a very personal way. We're going to hear from today about a topic, uh, which the title of which is almost as long as somebody else's abstract. It is Evolved Base Editors, Prime Editors, Recombinases, and Transposases for Targeted Gene Correction and Integration in Cells, Animals, and Patients. That sounds like we're in for quite a ride. So without further ado, oh, one other thing. If you are wanting on the internet to pose questions during the course of this, please use the Q&A function. Uh, not the chat box, use the Q&A. I will serve as the moderator at the end and try to pick out some of those, although we will probably have more questions than we can answer in the time available. If you're in the room, of course, uh, we'll, we'll be able to listen to you directly. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor David Liu. All right. Um, thank you, Francis, for the very thoughtful introduction. Uh, it's... Um, a real pleasure to share with this group some of our recent and 
uh, mostly new work on developing molecular machines that perform precise gene correction or large gene integration uh, in cells, animals, or patients, as Francis noted. In fact, uh, when I proposed this title to uh, a former group member who's now a friend of mine, um, she said, why don't you just title it All the Things, which I guess is uh, is young person's speak for your title is too long. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll present uh, today a clinical update on base editing and prime editing, followed by uh, three recent or unpublished stories on how we've used the same principles of engineering and evolving gene editing systems to perform efficient programmable gene correction or gene integration uh, in mammalian cells. Uh, and I th think the overall theme of my talk, uh, really the only important meta lesson, is that uh, when you are engineering complex molecular machines to perform uh, chemical functions in a very constrained environment, like the environment of a cell without perturbing things in ways that we think would be unhelpful or harmful, uh, it pays to have the humility to understand what you can engineer from first principles and what you can't. Uh, and in our case, when we realize that there are specific problems that are too challenging for us to engineer, we instead devote our um, resources, our creativity, our hard work uh, to setting up a Darwinian evolution system to overcome that specific challenge. And you'll see that as a recurring theme in, in my talk. All right. So I'll start uh, with my disclosures, the most relevant of which is that I'm a co-founder of companies that develop or deliver gene editing or epigenome modulating therapeutics, including beam therapeutics, prime medicine, chroma medicine, and envelop therapeutics. So I'll start with a brief uh, summary and update on base editing and prime editing. These were technologies, uh, base editing, summarized on this slide, is, is a suite of technologies that we first developed or first reported in 2016. Uh, and the motivation was to develop ways of efficiently installing or correcting point mutations in living systems. Um, base editors, like prime editors, are not known to exist in nature and instead were engineered and evolved in our laboratory. So base editors use the targeting mechanism of a programmable DNA binding protein, such as a disabled Cas9 or a tail repeat array or a zinc finger array to bind a desired DNA sequence. But instead of cutting the DNA like a nuclease, base editors use deaminase enzymes evolved in our laboratory to directly convert one base to another. And then they guide the cell through DNA repair processes that make this conversion permanent on both DNA strands. <clears throat> there are two major classes of base editors. The cytosine base editors convert C to T or G to A, while the adenine base editors convert A to G or T to C. Nature actually doesn't provide any known enzyme that performs the chemistry needed by the adenine base editor uh, on uh, to, to, to basically deaminate deoxyadenosine. So uh, we actually evolved in our laboratory, the first and still sort of only family of deoxyadenosine deaminase enzymes that made possible the creation of adenine base editors. And current generation adenine base editors and cytosine base editors actually all ultimately are derived from this laboratory evolved enzyme. We also developed uh, CRISPR-free all protein base editors that use tail or zinc finger proteins to target DNA instead of CRISPR. And the reason that that's useful is that it enables the first purposeful changes in the sequence of mitochondrial DNA in living cells and animals. It had not been previously possible to precisely edit mitochondrial DNA because of the inability of guide RNAs and therefore of CRISPR systems to enter the mitochondria. But these all protein systems uh, have no problem uh, being localized to the mitochondria where they can make precise edits. All right, so our lab and many, many others have now used base editors, both ex vivo and in vivo, to treat animal models of human genetic diseases. Um, shown in this slide, uh, not giving uh, nearly enough credit to the many persons, 
decades of work it took to complete both of these studies. But here's just two examples, uh, ex vivo based editing to rescue sickle cell disease in mice. And below that, the effort that you've already heard about from Francis and Leslie and, uh, and Sammy Basso, the use of in vivo base editing to rescue a humanized mouse model of progeria developed by uh, Francis Collins's lab. And in both cases, we can extensively rescue the disease phenotype. In some cases, uh, many cases, as we'll talk about more later, a genetic disease is caused by a variety of mutations or even just by deletion of an entire gene. In, those, in some of those cases, you can still develop a single gene editing treatment that can serve all those patients. Um, recently, we reported a one-time base editing treatment for spinal muscular atrophy, which has historically been the leading genetic cause of infant mortality worldwide. And our strategy uses a base editor to convert the defective SMN2 gene copy that all humans have into a healthy copy of SMN1, which is the gene whose homozygous loss causes SMA. So in this way, we could take a, a, a sort of defective gene copy uh, that uh, really doesn't serve a purpose uh, other than to allow SMA patients to be born, SMA patients having homozygous loss of SMN1, only to then suffer debilitating loss of motor function. Uh, and we showed that a one-time co-administration of the base editor, along with the antisense oligonucleotide nusinersen, resulted in a four-and-a-half-fold increase in median lifespan, and as you can see in these videos, a strong rescue of motor function phenotypes. All right, so um, there are many, many other uh, papers that have been published using base editing, in some cases in therapeutic animal studies. Uh, there are, uh, the last time I checked, uh, almost 2,000 uh, uh, papers, research papers that use base editing. And at least nine base editing clinical trials shown in this table have uh, begun. And at least three of these trials, uh, marked in green here, have already reported clinical outcomes. Alyssa Tapley, uh, this then 13-year-old girl in the UK with T-cell leukemia, was the first patient treated with a base edited therapeutic. In 2022, she was infused with CAR T cells containing three base edits in a clinical trial led by Wasim Kwasim. And following treatment with these triply base edited CAR T cells, Alyssa's T cell leukemia went into complete remission. And now more than two years after treatment, her cancer uh, remains undetected. And as you can read in this letter her family sent to our lab, uh, Alyssa is now back in school and hopes to pursue a career in biomedicine. Earlier this year, another uh, ex vivo base editing trial in China reported curing a patient of transfusion dependent beta thalassemia by base editing the fetal hemoglobin promoter to reawaken fetal hemoglobin expression in more than 80% of that patient's red blood cells. And in late 2023, so just uh, at the end of last year, uh, clinical results were announced for the first in vivo base editing clinical trial. This is a collaboration between VERF Therapeutics and Beam Therapeutics. So patients with genetic predisposition to very high levels of LDL cholesterol were given a single injection of an adenine base editor programmed to precisely disable a splice site in PCSK9, with the result that functional PCSK9 levels and LDL cholesterol levels in these patients were durably lowered. You can see the LDL cholesterol levels lowered uh, by up to 55% at the highest dose tested. And so this outcome demonstrates the potential of in vivo base editing, both to treat serious disease, but also to lower future disease risk. Okay, so base editors are these engineered proteins that precisely correct pathogenic transition mutations in cells, animals, and patients. What about the other types of mutations, the transversions, the insertions, the deletions, to correct or install those other types of mutations, we develop prime editors. Prime editors are fusions of programmable NICases with specially engineered reverse transcriptases. They use an engineered prime editing guide RNA, or PEG RNA for short, shown in green here, which not only specifies the target site for editing, but also contains the information specifying the desired edit. 
So the way prime editors work is that they NIC the target DNA site, and then they use the NICed DNA strand to prime reverse transcription of a specially designed extension on the PEG RNA that serves as a reverse transcription template. The engineered reverse transcriptase domain of the prime editor then copies the desired edit directly onto the target DNA strand. This creates a three prime flap uh, of DNA containing the edit that the cell resolves into a heteroduplex containing one edited strand and one unedited strand. And fortunately, uh, these three prime flaps tend to be favored after this process equilibrates because five prime flaps are very common intermediates in DNA replication and DNA repair. And so the cell has evolved, your cells have evolved machinery to cut them off and ligate the resulting gaps. Um, so the most efficient prime editing systems then nick the non-edited DNA strand, which just like we do with base editors, stimulates the cells into remaking that strand using the edited strand as a template. And that completes the permanent editing of both DNA strands. And since the PEG RNA's reverse transcription template here is what specifies uh, the desired edit and is totally up to you, you can make virtually any substitution, deletion, or insertion, currently of up to a couple hundred base pairs uh, using this strategy. And since our original report, our initial prime editing report in 2019, uh, many labs, including our own, have improved and studied virtually every aspect of prime editing systems. Uh, protein architectures, codon usage, nuclear localization signals, PEG RNA stability, and uh, cellular mismatch repair. Uh, these are all factors that have a pretty important uh, role in influencing prime editing outcomes. And yet, despite all of the substantial improvements in advancing prime editing from looking at these issues, the reverse transcriptase at the heart of the prime editor protein proved to be the most challenging component to improve, despite the efforts of many labs and the knowledge of thousands of reverse transcriptases. So recently, we ap applied our phage, phage assisted continuous evolution or PACE platform to generate a highly evolved prime editor proteins with improved editing properties. <clears throat> so to very briefly uh, explain PACE, uh, during PACE, phage bacteriophage containing gene variants of interest uh, with the desired activity replicate despite being continuously diluted. So we are growing these phage in a culture that's being continuously diluted with fresh host cells and we've designed a genetic circuit so that those phage encoding genes of interest, variants of interest, can replicate faster than they're diluted, while those phage that uh, encode genes lacking the desired properties are quickly washed out of the vessel that we call the lagoon. And since the filamentous bacteriophage life cycle can take place as quickly as every 10 minutes, PACE enables evolution campaigns that are thousands of generations of mutation selection and replication, which used to take thousands of weeks, to now take place on a sort of PhD practical, practical PhD compatible timescale. All right, so to pace an activity, you have to link it to uh, phage propagation. So if we want to pace prime editors, we have to link them to phage propagation. And one of several genetic circuits that we established to uh, make this linkage is shown here. So in this case, prime editing corrects an inactivating mutation, typically a deletion, in the gene encoding T7 RNA polymerase that enables T7 RNA polymerase to drive expression of gene 3, which is required for phage propagation. And so using this simple uh, circuit, we can evolve uh, prime editors in PACE very, very rapidly. And in the interest of time, I'll just mentioned that after thousands of generations of evolution, uh, many different campaigns, we observed uh, two sets of key outcomes from prime editor pace. First, we sought to evolve uh, reverse transcriptases that could support prime editing, but were very compact. And so we started with a bunch of uh, naturally occurring compact reverse transcriptases, which generally did a very poor job with prime editing. But after putting them through the prime editing pace, they 
showed a dramatically increased ability to perform prime metadata in human cells by more than tenfold on average. Um, so uh, now PE6A and PE6B, which are two such compact evolved variants, uh, performed comparably to PE max, which was the gold standard uh, at the time, the gray bars, despite being uh, in the reverse transcriptase only about half the size of PE max. And that's uh, very useful for in vivo delivery efforts. The other set of outcomes that are uh, worth mentioning is uh, PACE evolved two variants called PE6C and PE6D that evolved to specialize on lawn prime edits. So here's an example where in this prime edit, we're inserting uh, a roughly 40 base pair LOX P site at a target site in human cells. And the reverse transcriptase template, if you put it through an RNA folding uh, algorithm, is predicted to fold into this giant hairpin. Uh, and PE6D does a much better job than PE max at making it through this hairpin. In fact, when we capture all the prime editing intermediates in a cell using a terminal transferase experiment, uh, we could observe that the PE max gold standard indeed had a hard time making it through this hairpin. And uh, you know, about half the time it would get stuck uh, in this hairpin and, and not uh, complete its reverse transcription, therefore had no chance of, of resulting in prime editing. In contrast, PE6D shown in the in the blue trace pretty much plows right through this hairpin and makes it all the way to the end of the reverse transcriptase uh, encoded flap. So these and many other data led us to discover that PE6C and PE6D evolved as prime editors that uh, did exactly what we challenged the system to do, uh, make lawn edits, uh, correct lawn deletions, for example, use PEG RNAs that uh, have a lot of internal secondary structure. And uh, they therefore excel when your reverse transcriptase templates have high degree of predicted folding stability around minus 23 kcals per mole or, or stronger. Uh, these P6 variants have uh, really benefited our ability to make challenging edits or especially in more challenging cell types. So here are some disease correction edits that are more complex than simple single nucleotide substitutions, uh, some data in patient fibroblasts, and you can see substantial enhancements of editing efficiencies using the PE6 variants uh, over the uh, PE max uh, gold standard. And the strongest advantages of these PE6 variants uh, we observed in vivo. So following injection into the brain, of dual AAV prime editing systems, uh, truncated PE max yielded poor uh, dual flap prime editing uh, insertion edits, such as the insertion of recombinase landing sites into this safe harbor locus um, in the mouse brain. But in contrast, PE6D, the pace evolved variant, yielded order of magnitude improvement in editing efficiency. Uh, and we also observed very large improvements in editing efficiency for PE6D uh, when just performing a simple single flap in large insertion uh, in the brain of a mouse. Or once again, we observed order of magnitude or larger improvements for PE6D over truncated PE max. All right, so all of these advancements in prime editing systems over the past few years have collectively had a really profound impact on our ability to make challenging therapeutic edits, especially in mismatch repair competent cells that used to be poorly edited. And perhaps the best example from our own recent work is the precise correction of the three missing DNA letters in CFTR that are the most common cause of cystic fibrosis. This uh, three base pair deletion, uh, CFTR F del uh, delta 508, is present in 85% of CF patients. We initially struggled to achieve more than single-digit percentage editing uh, to correct uh, CFTR delta F508. Uh, but in uh, work that we just published, improvements in PEG RNA design, PEG RNA stability, prime editing protein architecture, mismatch repair evasion, strategic silent edits, the PE6 variants I just described, and uh, the use of 
dead guide RNAs to increase the accessibility of the site together dramatically increased our ability to correct this important mutation, resulting in efficient, precise insertion of the missing three CTT nucleotides in this CFTR mutation. And when we apply this optimized prime editing system to uh, cystic fibrosis patient airway epithelial cells, we also observe reasonably efficient correction of this mutation and substantial restoration of ion channel function shown in the blue curve. Uh, and you can see that the degree of restoration in ion channel function we observed in these edited patient cells was similar to or even greater than uh, the function that was restored upon treatment with the so-called trikafta cocktail of three small molecule CF drugs, Alexacaftor, Tezacaftor, and Ivacaftor. These are drugs that have revolutionized uh, CF treatment, but they require a lifetime of treatment at a current cost of more than $300,000 a year. Um, like base editing, prime editing has quickly been applied both ex vivo and in vivo to rescue animal models of human genetic diseases. For example, ex vivo prime editing of sickle cell patient hematopoietic stem cells, followed by transplantation in mice. Uh, rescues sickle cell disease phenotypes. Now we can take advantage of prime editing's ability to make any substitution by converting the T back into an A in the sickle allele, which converts it back to wild type hemoglobin. Um, and then shown uh, on the bottom half of this slide are, is just one of many examples now published in the literature of in vivo prime editing, in this case to rescue mouse models of retinitis pigmentosa, uh, phenylketonuria has also been uh, rescued by in vivo prime editing. And these examples of in vivo uh, therapeutic prime editing in animals were reported by Kai Yao's lab and Gerald Schwank's lab, res respectively. Uh, FDA recently cleared the first clinical trial of a prime editing therapeutic only uh, four and a half years after we published the first prime editing paper in late 2019. Uh, this is work by scientists at Prime Medicine. They developed an ex vivo prime editing treatment for chronic granulomatous disease, or CGD. This is a debilitating and lifespan shortening condition caused by mutations in genes encoding NADPH oxidase subunits. And a prime editing system that corrects one of the most common mutations that causes CGD, uh, a two base pair deletion, um, uh, results in. Uh, very efficient editing and engraftment in mice. Uh, the long-term hematopoietic stem cells did not lose their engraftment potential in contrast with some forms of gene editing like uh, nucleases that can cause a lot loss of engraftment potential. Uh, and the treatment restored NADPH oxidase uh, activity in cells derived from the edited hematopoietic stem cells from CGG patients uh, and uh, genome-wide, transcriptome-wide, and over 500 targeted amplicon assays collectively uncovered no detected off-target edits. And this is consistent with uh, what uh, we and others in the field now believe is the inherent resistance of the prime editing mechanism that I showed to editing at off-target sites, because instead of just one DNA hybridization event controlling specificity, you have multiple such events involving all those flaps and priming, reverse transcription, uh, and each of those hybridization events is an opportunity to reject an off-target sequence. So uh, it really appears to, to us and to many other labs that uh, prime editing is an unusually um, high fidelity way to perform gene editing because of its mechanism. Okay, so the hard work of many researchers and many clinicians have rapidly translated base editing and prime editing into now 10 clinical trials. Uh, these precise gene correction technologies are very well suited to treat genetic conditions that arise from a small number of mutations or to install edits in wild type genes that reduce disease risk like the mutation installed in PCSK9. But a major challenge for our field is the allelic diversity of many genetic diseases, some of which are caused by hundreds or even thousands of different mutations in the same gene. And until dramatic regulatory streamlining occurs, which I'm optimistic will occur, uh, hopefully following the, the successful uh, 
therapeutic uses of gene editing that are in many clinical trials now. But until that happens, it's difficult to imagine a company developing hundreds of different gene editing agents needed to treat the vast majority of patients who suffer from an allelically diverse genetic disease. Now, in the meantime, this community has long recognized a potential solution to this problem for loss of function diseases. Uh, and that uh, solution, of course, is gene complementation therapy, first used to treat uh, SCID 34 years ago. So gene complementation therapy introduces a healthy copy of genes into cells, uh, traditionally using a viral vector. And in principle, this approach can benefit any patient suffering from any loss of function genetic disease, regardless of that patient's specific mutation. Now, trad uh, traditional gene complementation therapy, as I just summarized, has had a number of clinical successes and important drugs, approved drugs, uh, but it suffers from drawbacks, including immune responses to the viral vector, uh, the risk of oncogenic DNA integration, the difficulty of redosing, uh, and the fact that if you are putting in an exogenously an exogenous gene copy uh, into a cell, uh, there's a good chance that that gene will lack its native regulatory context, which can lead to underdosing or overdosing or dysregulated function. And scientists have increasingly learned that for many uh, key genes, such as rhodopsin, MECP2 for Batten disease, even SMN1 for SMA, overexpression of the missing gene or the damaged gene is known to induce toxicity in target cell types such as retina or neurons. So a newer form of gene complementation therapy uses programmable nucleases to cut a gene and then uh, uses um, uh, homology-directed repair, HDR, or end joining to try to insert a healthy gene copy into that cut target site. This approach requires double-strand breaks for efficient insertion, which brings drawbacks such as chromosomal abnormalities. The fact that these double-stranded breaks generate mostly mixtures of indels at the target site that we can't control. Uh, the fact that donor DNA can insert into double-stranded breaks in either orientation and can insert zero times, one time, or multiple times, uh, generating concatenomeric insertions uh, into the cut site. So ideally, one would like to efficiently integrate an entire healthy gene or exon in human cells at the endogenous locus where uh, the patient suffers from pathogenic gene loss or into a safe harbor site without requiring uh, double-strand DNA breaks. And so in the rest of my talk, I'll present uh, two such approaches, uh, both made possible by laboratory evolution. As background to the first method, in uh, 2021, we reported prime editing to install site-specific recombinase landing sites, uh, like at P or at B sites, uh, into a target genomic locus of our choosing. And then we integrated large gene-sized DNA at these newly installed uh, landing sites with a site-specific recombinase, like uh, BXB1. And as you can see here, the efficiency of this single transfection process, which we call passage, was modest, but these efforts represented the first RNA programmed site-specific insertion of gene-sized DNA in mammalian cells without requiring double-stranded breaks. So why is the overall efficiency of this process so low? Well, as you can see here, a prime editing can install recombinase landing sites with more than 80% efficiency but if you treat mammalian cells that already contain a BXB1 landing site pre-installed in their genomes, so no prime entity necessary anymore, if you just treat those mammalian cells with BXB1 recombinase and a donor DNA plasmid, at least five previous studies uh, cited at the bottom of the slide have all found that the maximum observed gene integration efficiency is approximately 10 or 20%. So in other words, the bottleneck in using prime editing and recombinase enzymes to perform targeted gene integration is the recombinase. So to address this bottleneck, we used PACE to evolve recombinases that catalyze more efficient gene integration. Uh, Samriti Pandey and Daniel Gow in our lab 
developed a pace selection for site-specific recombination by linking recombinase activity to gene three expression. In this case, by um, arranging the gene circuit so that only upon recombination will um, an otherwise promoterless copy of gene three get a promoter and uh, and be expressed. So they subjected the XP1 recombinase to um, hundreds of generations of evolution using the system, and they enriched many mutations throughout the enzyme. We were really excited to find that the best resulting BXP1 recombinase variants support much higher levels of targeted gene integration when combined with prime editing. So the best performing recombinase emerging from PACE directly, we call EVO BXP1, and it's and the best recombinase that we generated by um, combining mutations from different PACE evolved clones, we called EEBXB1 for evolved and engineered. And using these recombinases with prime editing resulted in very large improvements in prime editing efficiency, uh, in, in sorry, in programmable uh, gene integration efficiencies. So single transfection experiments right. shown here that simultaneously introduced prime editors, the PEG RNAs, the evolved recombinases, and the cargo DNA into human cells at the same time we're now typically yielding 20 to 35% targeted gene integration, an improvement of, of uh, several fold over the use of wild type BXB1 in canonical passage. And importantly, the evolved recombinases retain their ability to integrate very large gene cargos exceeding uh, 10,000 base pairs. The labs of Jonathan uh, Gutenberg and Omar Abidaya uh, reported the use of prime editors fused to wild type BXP1 recombinase with a cleavable linker, a system that they called PASTE, to perform targeted gene integration. And so we compared side by side um, passage, which uses wild type BXP1, EVO passage, and EE passage, which use the evolved recombinases with uh, this fused PASTE system uh, for the ability to integrate gene sized DNA cargos at a variety of targeted genomic sites in three types of human and mouse cells. And we observed that EE passage results in about fourfold higher average gene integration than uh, regular passage uh, with wild type recombinase shown in gray, and on average 16 fold higher uh, integration efficiencies than PASTE. And we found that using BXB1 recombinase to a prime editor in the PASTE system, even if you use a self cleaving linker, substantially impairs prime editing activity. And this may explain why, uh, even if you uh, arrange the, the fusion so that it can eventually uh, be cleaved, uh, paste with a prime editor recombinase fusion is so much less efficient than uh, passage with separate prime editor recombinase proteins. Next, we compared EE passage with wild type passage and paste to make now seven uh, real therapeutic targeted gene integrations at a variety of human and mouse, uh, in a variety of human and mouse cell lines, inserting large uh, genes or exons into uh, genomic loci that in principle would allow these inserted genes to exert some therapeutic benefit. And we again observe large consistent benefits uh, of using the evolved recombinase and EE passage which yielded 32% average therapeutic gene integration among bulk unsorted cells, compared to 12% when you use the wild type recombinase and 4.4% uh, with paste. We performed off-target analyses of the evolved recombinases using uh, a couple different assays, a global M-cherry plasmid integration assay and uh, nomination of candidate off-target sites by adopting, adapting the UDITAS tagmentation based off target nomination method. And to summarize a lot of data, we observed that so long as at P is installed in the genome with prime editing and at B is present in the donor DNA, off target integration remained low for all of the tested methods. We recommend not installing at B in the human genome because there are a handful of at B like pseudocytes in the human genome that can lead to off target integration, especially with these higher activity uh, evolved recombinases. The evolved recombinase and EE passage also perform much better than wild type BXB1 in more diverse cell types, such as iPSCs, or even in primary human cells like these primary human fibroblasts. 
we can observe 30% targeted gene integration in primary fibroblasts. And so now that the evolved recombinases and evolved prime editors can together mediate quite efficient targeted gene integration, we've turned much of our ongoing efforts uh, to uh, trying to evade cellular immune responses to the introduction of large DNA donors, which is a key ingredient in these targeted gene integration efforts. Okay, and the final uh, vignette that I'll share is the result of a wonderful three-year collaboration with Sam Sternberg's lab at Columbia to evolve CRISPR-associated transposases, or CASs, to work efficiently in human cells. CASs were first discovered from metagenomic data by Joe Peters and Eugene Kunin's labs in 2017, and then characterized experimentally in 2019 by Sam Sternberg's lab and by Fungeon's lab. The type 1F cast systems that I'll, I'll focus on in, in the rest of my talk use a cascade complex of Cas6, 7, and 8 to engage target DNA in a guide RNA program manner. A protein called TNIQ then connects the cascade bound target DNA with TNSC. And TNSC then recruits a heterodimeric TNSA, TNSB transposase to the target site. The transposase then mediates integration of donor DNA, which can be kilobases long, and it integrates at about 49 base pairs uh, downstream of the target site. Because DNA integration occurs in a single process without free genomic double strand breaks, uh, these CRISPR associated transposases do not generate genomic indel byproducts. And indeed, in bacterial cells, they have all of these remarkable properties. They're very efficient. They're very specific. Uh, they um, yield minimal undesired products. Unfortunately, if you take the casts that have been published and try to use them in mammalian cells, uh, they show zero or very low activity. Uh, you can tell by the y-axis here of this graph that even if you take the winner of a fairly large screen of many type 1 Cas homologs and look for the ones that have the highest activity in mammalian cells. The most active of these tested analogs uh, in, in the paper published by Sam's lab supported less than 0.1% targeted gene integration into the genome of mammalian cells. Now, the Sternberg lab also discovered that uh, CLIP-X, which is a bacterial protein that promotes disassembly of the post-integration transposase complex can dramatically increase the efficiency of genomic integration uh, by more than 100-fold. But unfortunately, if you start at 0.01% uh, and you increase it 100-fold, you end up only at about 1%. Um, moreover, CLIP-X is toxic, unfortunately. And so uh, it might have limited applicability, especially for therapeutic applications. So unlike bacterial immune systems, like CRISPR nucleases, which probably evolved to do as much DNA recognition and cutting as possible, Cas likely did not evolve to be maximally active. You could argue that a transposase that is hyperactive uh, would probably exert a fitness penalty on its host cell. So we speculate that transposition catalysis or DNA binding might be limiting the integration efficiency of naturally occurring casts in mammalian cells because they never evolved for high activity. But we don't know, again, here's where the humility part comes in, we don't know what the molecular determinants of these cast properties are. So the challenge of developing cast systems that function robustly in mammalian cells is a problem ideally suited, again, to protein evolution. So in work that was initiated by former graduate student Shannon Miller and co-led by Isaac Witte and Simon Heitzinger in our lab and by George Lampe in, in Sam Sternberg's lab, we used PACE to evolve CAS through thousands of generations of mutation, selection, and replication. We had to develop several different PACE circuits to achieve this goal that of linking uh, phage propagation to uh, CRISPR-associated transposase activity. Uh, and one of the circuits is shown here, where again, we uh, rely on transposition in order to introduce a promoter in front of an otherwise promoterless essential phase change gene three. Okay, so 
uh, over the past several years, we used several of these pace selection circuits to evolve a wild type, type 1F cast into one that functions well in mammalian cells. And while I don't have time uh, in the little bit of time remaining to cover all of the findings, I'll just summarize that we first learned how to tailor the use of PACE to rapidly explore the fitness landscapes in CAS to improve various CAS properties. The PACE campaign that yielded the most uh, improved CAS variants is shown here. And these genes, such as P4-1, that emerged from this uh, very long evolutionary campaign, survived more than 1,000 generations of mutation selection and replication, which would have taken us decades to perform using traditional protein evolution methods. What are those mutations? Well, we observe numerous mutations in all cast components uh, emerging from this process, but many of the evolved mutations are predicted to lie at the interface of TNSB, uh, the catalytic subunit of the transposase, and other components of the cast complex. Reversion analysis, which I'm not showing here, demonstrated that all of these evolved TNSB mutations actually contribute to improved cast activity. All right, so how do they perform in human cells? Uh, wild type casts, as I mentioned, mediate less than 0.1% genomic DNA integration in uh, HEC 293 T cells. In contrast, the PACE evolved casts uh, mediate guide RNA programmed DNA integration more than 200 fold more efficiently, such that the P4 1 variant oh, yeah. emerging from the last phase of evolution integrated target DNA cargo into um, three genomic test sites in human cells with a typical efficiency of approximately 10 to 20 percent without any enrichment for transfected or edited cells. The Sternberg's lab discovery that the bacterial protein CLIP-X might uh, promote disassembly of the post-integration transposase complex was critical to increase the genomic integration efficiency of wild-type casts in mammalian cells from about 0.01% to about 1%. Uh, we wondered whether the evolved uh, casts retained this dependence on CLIPEX, but when we characterized uh, their CLIPEX dependence, we were uh, very happy to see that PACE evolved progressively less and less dependence on, CAS, uh, on CLIPEX such that the, the cast variants emerging from the last four stages of PACE pretty much showed complete independence from FlipX. And these findings suggest that PACE may have evolved its own mechanisms to promote disassembly of the post-integration complex, thus capturing the enhancement that arised uh, previously from FlipX, but without having to introduce a toxic protein into cells. Um, now, during the course of this collaboration, we evolved or rationally engineered changes in all seven of the cast protein components. And then we combined many combinations of these evolved and engineered components, uh, resulting in uh, what we call EE cast system, the evolved and engineered variant. Uh, and when we test them at six endogenous genomic uh, sites in human cells, we observed about 10 to 30 percent. Uh, targeted gene integration in these uh, human HEC 293T cells without any uh, enrichment of transfected or edited cells. And so thus far, most of the genomic sites I showed you were just test sites in the human genome that are commonly used to uh, characterize gene editing technologies. But to determine if EE cast can function efficiently at therapeutically relevant genomic loci, we tested their ability to integrate donor DNA into a dozen genomic sites of clinical interest, including four safe harbor loci, uh, as well as uh, the track locus for uh, CAR T therapy, and seven genomic uh, loci where loss of function mutations cause uh, Stargardt's disease, cystic fibrosis, Fanconi anemia, sickle cell disease, uh, beta thalassemia, SCID, uh, Rett syndrome, or uh, phenylketonuria. And once again, we observed generally uh, reasonable DNA integration efficiencies in these HEC 293T cells of 10 to 30 percent, with an average efficiency at these therapeutically relevant loci of 13 percent. 
comparing the efficiency of EE cast to wild type cast at these 13 sites. Uh, the wild type cast bars are barely visible because they're basically coincident with the X axis revealed that on average, uh, the integration efficiency improved by more than 350 fold. While we are hopeful that the efficiency of EE casts can be further improved, uh, its integration efficiencies are now sufficient to already offer potential benefits to patients suffering from a variety of loss of function genetic disorders if we can translate these improved integration efficiencies uh, into uh, animal and eventually clinical studies. Uh, EE cast systems show good tolerance for large DNA payloads. Uh, shown here are integration efficiencies using payloads from 100 base pairs to 15,000 base pairs, keeping the total mass of DNA used in each experiment constant. Uh, and you can see that uh, uh, we can still observe reasonable targeted G DNA integration efficiencies, uh, even of 15,000 base pairs. Um, probably the drop-off you see from 10 to 15,000 is simply because uh, we're keeping the total mass of DNA constant since uh, if we simply added a lot more DNA, the cells would uh, would find that more toxic. Uh, but you can uh, see that there's a relatively flat landscape, even though the stoichiometries of DNA are changing as we're increasing the size of the DNA payload. And indeed, uh, these cast, EE cast systems uh, retain many of the favorable attributes of the natural type 1F cast systems that made them such good starting points for evolution. They yield primarily insertion, simple insertion products, avoiding the formation of an undesired byproduct known as a co-integrate that contains the entire vector backbone and is commonly associated with the type 5 cast systems. E cast, just like wild type cast, um, is quite regioselective for target uh, for, for cargo integration, uh, which predominantly occurs 49 base pairs downstream of the target sequence. The EE cast integration is also predominantly unidirectional, uh, with over 90% of insertion products occurring in a single orientation, just like the wild type cast, and consistent with the fact that the integration proceeds without the formation of double stranded genomic breaks, we don't observe any significant indel formation at target sites. So together, these results uh, demonstrate that our evolution and engineering efforts enabled robust cast activity in mammalian cells without sacrificing these key features of naturally occurring type 1 CRISPR-associated transposases. OK, so to summarize, uh, base editing and prime editing are precise gene correction technologies that have quickly moved from initial report to rescuing genetic disease in animals to now nine base editing and one prime editing clinical trial. Uh, all of that occurred in either five and a half or four and a half years, respectively. And thanks largely to the efforts of many, many researchers, um, both in this room and in the gene editing community, more broadly speaking. Using PACE to evolve BXB1 or Cominase yielded EEBXB1 variants that can be used together with prime editing to mediate quite efficient targeted gene integration at a variety of uh, mammalian cell types, including some primary uh, human cells. And evolving CRISPR-associated transposases yielded EE cast variants that catalyze single system targeted gene integration in human cells, again, uh, with the possibility of achieving therapeutically relevant efficiencies. We hope these developments will eventually help address one of the longstanding needs in the gene editing field which is namely the ability to precisely insert whole copies of healthy genes or gene fragments into genomic sites of our choosing uh, efficiently without requiring double-stranded breaks and uh, without generating excessive byproducts so that these inserted cargos can uh, be subject to their native regulatory context. All right, so finally, I'll just end by expressing uh, my deep gratitude to the remarkable uh, postdocs, graduate students, undergraduates, and collaborators who have made uh, all of this work possible. The PE6 work was co-led by uh, Jordan Doman and Samriti Pandey in collaboration with Mark Osborne and colleagues. The EE Passage work was co-led by Samriti and Daniel Gao 
in collaboration with uh, Mark Osborne and others. And the EE cast work, as I mentioned, was co-led by Isaac Witte, uh, George Lampe, and Simon Eitzinger in a wonderful collaboration with uh, Sam Sternberg's lab. Uh, and many, many other researchers uh, have contributed to the development and therapeutic application of base editing and prime editing, uh, the development of which were led by former group members, Alexis Co Comor, uh, Nicole Godelli, and Andrew Anzalon. And finally, I'm happy to um, take any questions and uh, thank you much, very much for your attention. David, that was a tour de force uh, covering an awful lot of fantastic technology. Uh, we have a little time for questions. Uh, there are people in the room, about 80 of them, and I gather about 300 people online. Uh, we'll give uh, first opportunity to the people in the room since you came here on purpose. So if you would, please use the microphone so that everybody who's on in the internet can hear the question. Please proceed. Thank you, Dr. Liu. That was a wonderful seminar. I'm wondering what are the limits of the cargo size for prime editing and whether the process of five prime truncation that occurs with non-LTR retrotransposon insertion uh, might bear on cargo size. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. If you just want to use a simple prime editing system with no recombinase, just the prime editor and the peg RNA, um, you can do so with uh, up to 100 or 200 base pairs. So for correcting pathogenic mutations, that covers more than 95% of pathogenic mutations. But uh, for certain applications where synthetic biology applications or trying to just integrate large exons, it's going to be tough to do that with simple prime editing systems. Of course, if you then couple them uh, with the use of recombinases, you can get arbitrarily large uh, gene integrations. We're currently working on trying to identify how to um, make simple prime editing variant system variants that can uh, put in thousands of base pairs, but uh, don't have anything to really report yet. Uh, but we are working on that problem to try to uh, directly uh, write thousands of base pairs in. We have uh, tried using retrotransposases. I'd say that uh, so far nobody has reported. Many labs have tried actually for decades, several decades, to, to do what you uh, described in your question. And uh, I'd say despite some valiant efforts, I haven't seen a, a published report or a presented uh, a piece of data that uh, showed a retrotransposase that meets the basic three criteria of uh, that would be needed for at least therapeutic gene editing, which is you know, it needs to be programmable, uh, needs to be efficient, and needs to be specific. Um, I, I'm, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that uh, retrotransposases could eventually meet those three criteria. Uh, but for now, I think if you want to do targeted gene integration in human cells, I would recommend using either prime editing and a recombinase, or soon we'll report and make all the reagents uh, publicly available, uh, the use of these uh, evolved CRISPR associated transposases. That's a lot. Thank you. Yeah, David, the internet questions also have been focusing on the size limitations. Um, you, you showed the examples with EECAST where you got up to 15 kilobases. You talked about earlier the importance of being able to tackle uh, conditions where you have a lot of allelic heterogeneity and you just want to fix the whole thing at once. CFTR, if I remember right, is 189 kilobases if you're trying to tackle the entire stretch of the genome. How do you see this playing out in that dream that I agree would be wonderful, where you don't have to have a specific therapeutic agent for each mutation? Right. I, I'm i pretty bullish on that approach. Um, I think it, it might be tough uh, to put 189 kilobases in. Uh, the machine aside, you have to get 189 kilobases, if that's your strategy, into the cell. And that's an awful uh, big chunk of DNA. Uh, we know cells tend to uh, not like having exogenous DNA introduced into them because they think they're under viral infection. So we're currently working on a variety of, of methods to try to circumvent uh, the cell's response. But fortunately, because uh, the mammalian genes are largely broken up into exons and introns, uh, in many cases, you'll be able to, we think, uh, replace 
either an exon that covers uh, a multitude of pathogenic variants, or if it's multiple exons, perhaps you would need to do a lot of basic science research to validate this hypothesis, but perhaps you could replace multiple exon intron regions with, uh, with a cDNA or a partial cDNA that uh, collectively covers a lot of the, the protein's open reading frame. Um, it's, of course, the, the introns that are most of the real estate hogs in, in that 189 kilobases. It's not just the CFTR protein, which is not that large. Um, so, you know, I think as these capabilities move forward, if they become part of the future of therapeutic gene editing, there will need to be a balance where researchers um, have to learn probably on a case by case basis. And eventually maybe we can get some confidence to extract some meta lessons as to just how much preservation is critical of the endogenous site. Uh, if you're using a recombinase, you're gonna leave behind a little recombinase landing site uh, afterwards. So it's already not gonna be base to base perfect with the original. Um, if you're using a CRISPR associated transposase, you'll also leave a transposition end uh, site, a little scar as well. But uh, I think we'll, having these capabilities will hopefully help motivate uh, some basic science studies that pave the way in each of these diseases for understanding what is a healthy looking uh, endogenous like uh, uh, rescue gene copy. What is the structure of that? Um, where are the nucleotides in the untranslated regions that we can leave our scars? And, um, you know, can we skip intron 13 and mush together uh, exons 13 and 14 uh, uh, because that collectively would cover, you know, 50%, 80% of patients of a certain disease? These are all really important questions that, as is often the case, you have to start with the biology, make sure it's bulletproof before you uh, you know, break out the uh, the editing the editing tools. I think we can maybe take a couple more questions in the room. If you're uh, interested, please come to the microphone from the internet. A question, um, which I hope I'm properly uh, phrasing to you. A uh, question is: Could you please estimate whether the peg RNA cDNA hybrid duplex? is the sole reason why you get prime edits, uh, or do you actually have something other than prime editing going on there in terms of the installation of changes? I'm not sure I totally understand the question, but I think it's suggesting maybe this particular apparatus is itself inspiring uh, some editing even without the entire complex. Uh, I share your uncertainty about what the question is asking, <laughs> but... Uh, but the existence of the various intermediates in the prime editing mechanism has been uh, confirmed by our lab and others through experiments biochemically, like terminal transferase, very recently by a beautiful structure of the prime editor complex with uh, PEG RNA and uh, different snapshots of DNA, uh, by uh, alpha fold three modeling as well, uh, which, you know, in a, in a, I don't know if it's depressing or exciting, is actually very, very close to the solved uh, structure, cryo-EM structure. Sorry, not crystal structure, cryo-EM structure. Um, uh, so I think the basic mechanism is reasonably well understood. Um, I'm not sure what PEG RNA cDNA hybrid complex refers to. Um, maybe the, the questioner can Send, send an email afterwards and I'll follow up. Thank you. Well, maybe I'll ask the last question before we let everybody adjourn, which is a more futuristic one. Uh, David, this uh, amazing array of technologies, uh, many of them evolved uh, to be more efficient than anything that would have possibly been a, available in nature, seems to have put us in a very strong position in terms of being able to do the kind of editing that would want to be able to do for the thousands of genetic diseases where we know the specific mutation, and also for those conditions where there's a strong allele out there that we know is going to be potentially therapeutically useful, like what you showed us with PCSK9. But one could imagine, for instance, wanting to edit APOE4 and make a major uh, decrease in the risk of Alzheimer's disease. It sort of seems like we need two things for that, but I want to see what you th would say about this. One is to have the editing capability. You've given us an amazing 
description of how that field has advanced. The other is the delivery system uh, to get the apparatus uh, to the right cell safely and effectively. So how do we put this together so that the next time you come and talk to us, uh, there's a whole bunch of additional success stories here that have solved not just the editing problem, but the delivery problem? Yeah, well, it, it, many labs, including mine, have um, have expanded their focus as the editing challenges have uh, been uh, knocked down one at a time to delivery, to um, developing systems that marry the best of uh, non-viral delivery and viral delivery, like uh, our engineered virus-like particle system that we really like. It's uh, engineerable, it's modular. We have uh, work that will hopefully be published soon um, that shows you can actually evolve these engineered virus-like particles, these EVLPs, to have improved production and improved um, transduction, delivery abilities. So I'm optimistic, uh, well, in part because I guess I'm inherently an optimist, but also because I think um, gene editing has inspired a whole generation, or maybe multiple academic generations at least, of scientists uh, to tackle delivery problems, people with molecular engineering backgrounds. Um, and I think that's going to yield fruit that within our scientific lifetimes will uh, dramatically expand the therapeutic scope, uh, therapeutic application of gene editing. And then I would say it will largely come down to the third bottleneck. So there's the editing machines. You need to have something to deliver or something that actually does the edit you want. Otherwise, you're not going anywhere. You need a way to deliver into the right cells. Uh, and then I think the third bottleneck on the horizon, and we're probably already there, is regulatory. We need a process uh, in order to maximally benefit society that fully takes advantage of the fact that modern gene editing agents are all programmable. So once you've worked out how to use LMPs to deliver messenger RNAs, encoding adenine base editors into the liver to edit PCSK9, it should be, you should be able to leverage all of that information, that de-risking, to deliver another mRNA guide RNA combination that uses an adenine base editor to edit a different gene in the liver that causes a metabolic disorder without having to start over. And that poses some uh, challenges to FDA, to uh, Peter Marks and his team and the review process. And I think they're very aware of those challenges. They are fairly rising to the occasion and trying to establish new mechanisms. But we really need, uh, we won't be able to say that we as, as scientists have um, fully allowed the science to live up to its potential to benefit patients until there's a highly streamlined pathway to uh, get these reprogrammed variants into patients that still, of course, does the very important work of de-risking off-target editing, de-risking potential other side effects from the delivery vector, et cetera. Uh, but that hopefully can be de-risked in a sort of one-time manner rather than having to do the same de-risking over and over again, uh, which not only causes a lot of time, but that's why it costs so much to, to do these clinical trials and to get eventually FDA drug approvals. It's because those, um, you know, satisfying the literally hundreds of criteria you have to check off in order to go through uh, an IND process um, is is challenging to pay once, but very very challenging to pay a hundred times or a thousand times, especially if each of those hundred gene editing therapeutics is only is only for treating ten patients or a hundred patients with one particular variant. So if we could instead um, uh, really modularize, platformize, as as Peter Marks likes to say, that process, I think that's when we'll start to see a real transformation in how we uh, can can help these patients, which collectively, you know, number hundreds of millions of patients. That's a wonderful way to think about going forward. Um, I hope Peter Marks is listening. I know he'd be in agreement with everything you were saying, but to get the whole regulatory system transformed that way is not going to be an easy lift. Right. And neither will the delivery systems. But, you know, let's just finish by saying we're on a pathway here towards something that could be truly dramatic, uh, the realistic opportunity with those thousands uh, of genetic diseases that currently have no effective treatment 
to have a scalable approach that might reach many more lives in a very powerful way. So thank you, David, for the way in which you have been leading so much of our dreams in that regard and for a wonderful seminar today. Thanks, David. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everybody. We are adjourned. <laughs>